loan factor that you get issued, right? So, I mean, most of you are familiar with the gainful employment rules and the fact that they were supposed to go in place, but they got actually uh, stalled, for lack of a better term, by, by the judge in Contreras, I think is his name. And, yeah, it was that if you could only take 12% of your salary and 20% of your discretionary income, and then the most interesting one was, and what he struck it down is because you could have, it was a three-pronged rule was that 35% of your students had to be paying back their debt. It seems like a fairly low barrier to jump. So, uh, but at the same time, he thought it, the, the way the standards were set were more rational. And again, there was still this enforcement question. Uh, you know, there, there's two sides of the student debt question, though, because the other one is, and this is where it seems like a bubble, because the interest rates are so low, it almost has become, un, you know, it's not even a real debt. Right? People don't think of it in that way. Um, and that it's sort of put to the side. And unfortunately, in this country, we did have a long tradition up until the 80s that not necessarily even paying back student debt. They're tracking the payment of student debt. I mean, that was just a, it was a newer phenomenon in this country where actually you could take on student loans in the past and not pay them back, but no one really would know one way or the other. That's how sort of this sort of poorly organized the Department of Ed was. You know, and then this question I mean, one of the things that I keep seeing is. We are in a period where utility is the driver of higher ed choice. There's nothing else, right? It's not about being, becoming more cultured. It's not about sort of the creation of sort of moral discipline, for lack of a historical term, or about research. It's about, you know, all we, we do the single biggest study of college students and their choices. And the thing that's jumped over the last five years, not surprisingly given the economy, um, is how much is it going to cost, and am I going to get a job again? And that, you know, people used to think that was sort of, yeah, that was one influencer of college choice. Now it's, it's fair to say it's become the influencer of college choice for a majority of the population. Not surprising, but what it suggests is the ability to demonstrate a career path and the ability to quickly get people to that career path. Is going to be come up that, or the, the ask that's going to come up is, universities do a great job, to your point, or they, they make a good effort at quote unquote capturing and reporting their data. The analytics of real time, right, what are the triggers or what are the signs of attrition, right? That's not, the question isn't what's your retention rate or what's your dropout rate, it's do you know what the biggest predictors, I mean eventually, what are the, what are the predictors of dropout, what are you doing to address those and or identify them? So basically, you, pull out, you you take out the employee and his debt burden. There's a, there's a lot of sense. Of that. I mean, the irony, and not to go all the way back, but I just want to make sure I, I got one thing clear to you guys. When, and I don't know how radically you could be in your negotiations with your dean, but what's amazing is you know, your tuition goes up, and it truly is a reflection of your cost for the most part. If you look at the explosion in tuition for general education, and, I, and I, as an English major undergrad, it's in some ways a show game, right? The reason why is why have the university gone from costing twenty-five thousand to fifty thousand dollars a year? It's because they're all competing for students, and that might seem counterintuitive. But in the general ed, what happened was they a um, tuition, you know, cost equals quality. And then B, and we were one of the ones to do the study, so I take some of the blame if that was there in heaven, is if you gave merit scholarships, you were more likely to get a student to go to your school. And so keep in mind, at one time, you basically only applied to so many schools because all the top schools would get together and then all the next tier, and they would actually say, how many, how many, who's this student applying to, where do you think they're going to go? And then the court struck that down in 91, 92, and you went from people on an applying average to four colleges to average applying to 12. And so all these schools got really obsessed with how do we differentiate ourselves. And the way they did it is they came up with merit scholarships, which is if you look at your typical liberal arts college, 80% of the students get some merit scholarship. And so what they have is a tuition that's quoted at $40,000. But basically a lot of them, but nobody pays them, because they all have these $20,000 merit scholarships because, you know what, people can go, you know, mom and dad can, can brag at the cocktail party. Well, I know they're only going to Lafayette or Lehigh or, and not Colgate, but they got, you know, they got a, they got a merit scholarship there. When the reality is, they're just paying themselves. Um, and unfortunately, unfortunately, though, that there is a burden that it falls on the professional programs, which true 
to like have a cost structure, right? There's no real cost structure of a large education. But that's the insane thing. Everything that's gone into higher ed as a cost in terms of liberal arts should be going down. I mean, yeah. Why do you need a huge library when you got Google? <laughs> you know, no offense, I still like the fact that libraries buy books. But yeah, the reality is everything about basic education should be much less expensive than it ever was. And yet it's gotten more expensive than ever.